The regular meeting for May 15th is being called to order. All seven trustees present. The regular meeting for May 15 is being called to order. All seven trustees present. Please stand for the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam President, members of the board, my name is Juan Cruz. Uh, for the record, uh, General Counsel for SMCISD. You have uh, on your agenda items two, three, four, and five that deal with the election that just uh, occurred here. So with respect to agenda item number three, uh, it's gonna proceed as normal, approving the order of the election results. Uh, with respect to agenda item number four, again, it'll proceed as normal, with the exception of issuing the certificate of election to district three, because there's been a petition for recount that was filed today. Uh, that recount we will have within seven, seven calendar days after the date that the recount is approved. Uh, we will verify that the recount is proper according to the law. Uh, and if it's not proper, then we'll give the uh, person that submitted the recount an opportunity to cure the defect. Uh, once that is held, there'll be time and place notice to the public if they wish to attend the, the recount. We'll work with the board president and the uh, staff here to conduct the recount. Um, so we will go ahead and then move on to agenda item number five. Uh, again, issuing the statement of oath of office to uh, districts one and two, and number three, with we, we will hold back for tonight. Uh, and agenda item six, also we will just defer that to next month's board meeting, okay? So um, we can proceed with agenda item number three at this time. Okay, canvassing for the school's proposition. Um, canvas votes show, and you do have um, you do have the canvas report, and it says uh, Exhibit A. I believe the first one is for the bond, and the second will be for the trustees. So, um, four, we had 1,999 votes for 74.65%. Against the bond was 679 votes for a total of 25.35%, 20, so making that a passing vote for the school's proposition bond. Okay, moving on to trustee, item number, okay, uh, district one. Uh, shows for uh, candidate one, Miguel Arredondo, 206 votes for a total of 63%. Brian K. Henderson, 121 votes for a total percentage of 37%, uh, declaring Juan Miguel Arredondo the winner for that race. District two. Elizabeth Trevino, 105 votes for 43.38%. Margie T. Villapondo, 155 votes for 59.62%, declaring Margie T. Villapondo the winner for that race. And District 3, Lupe Castillo, 240 votes for 50.53% of the votes. And Mariano Zamora at 235 votes for 49.47%. At this time, uh, declaring Lupe Castillo the winner for that uh, District 3. Any questions? So we could proceed with item number three, which is the recommendation is to approve the order canvassing the May 6, 2017 bond election returns and issuing the certificate for the order as presented. Is there a motion to that effect? Yeah, I will make a motion that the board approve the order canvassing bond election returns and declare the bond proposition passed and certify that the board approves the canvassing and completes the certificate of order. Second. Correct. All in favor? 7 0. Congratulations. Let me do a second. Second. So, 
I move that the board approve the attached or the order canvassing election returns of the May 6, 2017 school trustees to the San Marcos Consolidated Independent School District Board of Trustees, single member district one, two, and three, and that the president of the Board of Trustees be authorized to prepare certificates of election for the newly elected trustees. For uh, at districts one and two, two. at this time. Okay. At this Sorry. time. Amend to one and two. Just as to the certification. Correct. All right, I'll second that. Seconded by Mr. McLaughlin. All in favor? Any opposed? 7 0. And now we move on to agenda item number five, which was to uh, a statement of oath of office for single members districts one and two at this time. And for the record, the district three, Ms. Costilla, continues with the full duties and responsibilities as all sitting board members. Okay, so now we just no, need the statement of oath of office for Margie and Miguel. I just want to make a quick statement. I want to thank the community, including the staff, for your support for the bond. Um, we appreciate you, your vote, and we promise to um, take good care of those funds and make sure they serve the students of the school district. Do you want to proceed? Ms. Prado, <laughs> Judge Prado. Do you want to do it together or separate, Marcia? Together is fine. So what I'll do is I'll ask you to say your name individually and then your district, but then the rest you can kind of say it together. Okay. okay? Raise your right hand, please. I, Juan Miguel Arredondo. I, Juan Miguel Arredondo. I, Margarita T. Villalpando. I, Margarita T. Villalpando. Do solemnly swear that I will pay the duties. Execute the duties. Execute the duties. Of, of the office. San Marcos District School Board. District 2. Okay. San Marcos CISD School Board District 1. Of the state of Texas. Of the state, state of Texas. Texas. And will do to the best of my ability. And, and will do to the, the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution. The Constitution. And laws. And laws. Of the United States. Of the United, of the United States. States. And of this state. And, and of, of this state. state. So help me God. So, so help me God. God. Okay. So congratulations. Proceed with the superintendent's report. I, I guess if we can just have a motion to defer the election of school board officers for the uh, June uh, school board meeting. Okay. There could be a motion to that effect. I move that we defer those uh, election of school board officers until Sorry. the June meeting. I'll second. Second of a Ms. Halsey. All in favor? Wait, can I have a count again? One, two, three, seven. Thank you. Proceed with the superintendent's report. Good evening, everybody, and thank you all for coming. I, too, want to echo the sentiments of our trustee here who uh, was kind enough to steal the thunder and thank everybody <laughs> for uh, the bond. I think uh, this bond was a symbol of uh, really a lot of people coming together uh, around a common vision to address capacity and equity and I think the, the vote I think speaks for itself you know I think one of the advantages that we had that a lot of people didn't have is we had naysayers on the committee um, that really questioned us as we were moving forward and so I think we did everything in a transparent manner I think this was a needs based uh, vote and I think it will help us address some some areas that I think we can do some great things with in the city. So I too appreciate everything that the PAC committee that the board did and that uh, in particular that Karen Griffith over here, she worked tirelessly um, doing multiple jobs and uh, after hours, uh, and very much so after hours, all our work was done after hours. So thank you again at this time. If I could get Chris Cooper up here, a phenomenal art teacher, she wants to come up here and we have a couple of presentations, and if the board members, if I could get y'all to come, come down to front. the front of the dais here. Hi there. There's not much volume back there. So I'm just going to use my teacher voice. That's okay with you guys. <laughs> so we're here tonight to recognize uh, some San Marcos High School students in the visual arts department who have had a great deal of success at the state level. Um, we have four 
San Marcos High School visual arts students who qualified for the Texas State Visual Arts Scholastic Event, or VASE, that was held in San Antonio on April 29th. Um, and by the way, we are going to be hosting the state meet for the next two years at San Marcos High School. Yay. So, uh, if I could have Jordan Gomez, Isabella de la Iglesia, Isabel Rocha, and Olivia Zdeb. Come on down, please. So these four ladies were all named All-State Artists by earning a top rating at the state level. Um, VASE is similar to UIL Music where the students are given a rating instead of a first, second, third, fourth place. Um, at the regional level, they have to be interviewed by a juror after they have written about their art. So they write about their art, they speak about their art, and then a juror, um, after an eight minute interview, fills out a rubric score for them. Those who get a top score are then advanced to what we call the next level of area and all the top rated pieces are spread out in the gymnasiums and the jurors pick the top 10%. Those are our state advancing artists. Then they do not interview at the state level. They simply get a rating using a rubric at a higher standard and those who get a top rating at state are considered all state artists. So we have Jordan Gomez, Olivia Zadeb, Isabella de la Iglesia and Isabel Rocha. So a little bit about these girls. Isabella and Isabel qualified for state last year. So this is a repeat for these two. And y'all were both all state last year, weren't you? Yeah, yeah they, so this is their second year to be all state. Um, this is the first time Jordan and Olivia have qualified for all state, but they got some additional honors. Um, both of those pieces were selected as part of the TAEA vase gold seal exhibit, which is about the top 8% more or less of the state, all state pieces. This is a traveling exhibit of about 150 to 160 pieces that will be going around the state until November. So we only have one sculpture instead of three that are here because the gold seal exhibit is kept. So we do have several views of Jordan's um, sculpture mainly ceramic, the one that has multiple views, and Olivia's necklace because they are part of that exhibit. Now Jordan also earned some additional honors. She was named the winner of our vase, state vase Jim Henderson scholarship and she will receive that money unless, did you get a check already? Okay, yeah. They'll, it'll come later. <laughs> it's in the mail. Um, now, she'll get us some scholarship money. Jim Henderson was the president of UT um, Arlington. Well, not the president. He was the um, dean of fine arts at UT Arlington when we started doing VASE, and he was our first supporter at the college level, and he has an endowed scholarship now for VASE students. Also, we just found out that Jordan's piece, which we submitted to the NAEA, National Art Education Association's National Art Honor Society nationwide exhibit, was accepted. Um, 700, yeah. 767 entries, they accepted 60, one of which was the zebra. Unfortunately, the zebra couldn't be shipped to Reston, Virginia, because it's property of Vase Gold Seal. So they're allowing us to submit the visual images with multiple views instead. So her work will be um, in the NAEA gallery through September, as soon as we get it in the mail. So congratulations to these ladies. Yes. Okay. okay, we have two additional students that we're recognizing because their work was chosen as part of the State Youth Art Month exhibit, which hangs at the Capitol in Austin and at the Bob Bullock Museum. Um, Natalie Flores could not be with us tonight. She's presiding over an NHS meeting tonight. And unfortunately, we don't have her artwork to show you because she gave it to her grandmother for Mother's Day. <laughs> so, sorry. But we have Margaret Hoover. Yay. 
Margaret's work is the print back there of um, the, it's a, it's a sort of deer and winged creature. Is it a woodcut? Yes. It's a woodcut, yeah. So these gals are all the students of Tom Rogers, who teaches AP and ceramics, and Amy Hall, who teaches our advanced drawing and photography. And yeah. Oh yeah, Isabella's. We didn't point out that Isabella's is over here. Amy's pointing to it. If it's I can, gorgeous. Chris, can I get the students to come up here with the teachers? With the teachers yeah. as well? Okay, come on. Go. Oh, no, come on. You sneak in. Oh, Margaret, here's your certificate. Hand it to you. Um, with my, my lovely spirited tie dye shirt from the day. I'll do a Congratulations, ladies. If I could get uh, Nikki Kanicki, I saw her in here somewhere. If Miss Kanicki could come up to the front. She might have. Yeah, I saw her. Let's see her hair in just a second. Yeah, come on, Nikki. While Ms. Kanicki and her students come up, I'll just read a little bit of a description. All right. All right. Y'all can start snapping pictures if you want while I read. So Travis Elementary School uh, Principal Nikki Kanicki received notification from the National Association of Elementary School Principals, the NAESP Foundation, congratulating Travis Elementary School with an Honor Student Council Excellence Award for the 2016-17 school year. The award recognized outstanding achievement conducted by student councils in the areas of community service, student leadership, citizenship, and school spirit. Travis will display the certificate in the school where all the students and staff can take pride in their school accomplishments. Congratulations, students, and Travis Elementary. If I could get Julia Antu, is she here? I know she's. Yes. And Julia, come on up front. You're next. So Julia Antu, the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, notified Goodnight Middle School eighth grader Julia Antu that her story has earned a national medal in the 2017 Scholastic Art and Writing Awards for her flash fiction piece entitled Daddy's Little Girl. Julia will be at, it gets better, you hold your ooze until later. <laughs> She will attend a national ceremony at Carnegie Hall in New York City on Thursday, June 8th to receive her award. More than 330,000 works of arts and writing by students in grades 7 through 12 were submitted, placing Julia within the top 1% of all those students. So congratulations to Julia. <laughs> And Ms. Pearson, our parents. Yeah. 
Introduce your parents. That is it. That is it for right now. I have one more. One more? No, I just have one more thing. Yeah. <laughs> one more. <laughs> so Julia's are going to be our national Hispanic scholar when she's a junior. Yes. Yay. No pressure. <laughs> Yay! Good job, Julia. So one final, one final thank you is to our vision van. So earlier this year, the Ellisor Foundation and Kids Vision for Life, the vision van, came to San Marcos CISD February 27th through February 27th and 28th, March 1st and 2nd, and the 20th and 22nd of March, and visited all six elementary campuses. Based on criteria from each school nurse, students that had failed previous vision screening tests, a form was sent home to the parents to sign from the Ellisor Foundation. The, the quali the, there were several qualifications that included students being on CHIP or Medicaid, the student may be on free or reduced lunch. The student may have broken or lost glasses or their prescription is older than a year but not qualify if the student was on private insurance. A total of 292 students were screened by the vision van with 244 students needing glasses. Most of the glasses were made on site in the vision van. The more extensive prescriptions were sent to a lab and some of those students received two pair of glasses. Almost all of our students have gotten their glasses to date. The Vision Van will be returning on May 17th to assist two students that need further testing and prescription adjustments. So the following information was uh, provided. The, you know, at an average cost of about $50 with the 244 students, the district received about $12,200 of in-kind services for our families in San Marcos CISD. None of this really would have happened without the cooperation of Deborah Gauntlet, TVI, Diane Eastwood, the head nurse at San Marcos CISD, along with all of the elementary school nurses, the elementary principals, Carter Hudson and Randy Holt with transportation, and the parent liaisons from each school. So we want to thank them and the Ellisor Foundation. And they, I think they're here, the, the members. Come on up. Well, they are here. So. You, you want me to go shake hands? You got to take one more picture. Okay. <laughs> that was my bad. I was wondering why you were sitting over there. I was like, just... Thank you. So, Rianne, if you have anything to say afterwards. Madam President, that concludes the superintendent's report. Next, we have our public forum, and I have five speakers. We'll begin with Luis Gonzalez Aponte. Hello, I first wanted to express my gratitude and thanks for your time today. Um, so I wanted to talk on the subject of teacher races for this upcoming school year. Um, I wanted to first list a few names. These names may not mean anything to y'all. Um, but so I'll start off with Mrs. Simmons, Ms. Sophia, Ms. Voss, Ms. Rodriguez, and Ms. Garcia. These were my first five teachers whenever I came to this school district 12 years ago as a first, uh, as a first grader. And now this year I'm graduating in the class of 2017, uh, being raised 12 years in the school district. Every single teacher has made a profound difference in my life, and it means a great deal 
to me for them to be able to be compensated properly for all their hard work. Um, I know that my opinion is sort of biased. My mother uh, has been a teacher in the school district ever since I came here, and I'm very close with many of my teachers. I can name all of my teachers since the first day of school up to the last day of school that I just had right now because they've all made a, such a profound difference in my life in contributing to what career field I wish to take. I wish to study music education here at Texas State, the best uh, place for music education in this great country of Texas. And so I wanted to express one last um, little bit of gratitude towards my teachers because this is the least that I could do for them. Really, really please consider um, just a generous 3% raise for the teachers of this school district for all the amount of work and great, great deal of inspiration that they give us as students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our second speaker, Rosa M. Aponte Colon. Good evening, members of the board, and good evening. Uh, members of the community. My name is Rosa Ponte. I'm sorry that I lost my voice due to the allergies, but following my wonderful son, I want to say thank you very much for everything that you do. Um, but I do want to talk about teacher's salary. Uh, last year, the race, even though it was wonderful, thank you very much, he only made a little dent. I only got $40 more a month. That's all I got last year. And this year, this coming year coming up, I'm going to lose my stipend as a bilingual teacher due to the bilingual changes. So I don't know if I will be a bilingual teacher or not. My scores show by itself. I have great scores and I know that. Um, and I'm proud of it. I'm a hard working teacher and I'm a dedicated teacher. And I'm here representing all of the dedicated teachers that work very hard day in and day out to make sure our students get the best education ever. The raise, even though it's a little thing, maybe 3%, that 3% means a lot to us. It's telling us we care about you and we want you to feel comfortable. We don't want you to hurt every month because you only got a $40 raise, I mean a $40 extra a month because of the insurance going up. So please consider it 3%. We worked very hard. This year, my students did excellent and I'm very proud of it. And I would like a race that will show, hey, you know what? The work that you did was worth it. And I know that I am. I am a great teacher. I know who I am. My son speaks uh, about all his teachers, and he's very proud. He's going to graduate, and we are very proud to be in this school district. We are. And I don't want to move to another district. I want to continue working in the school district my kids grew up with and graduated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, James Brazil. Uh, good evening. My name is James Brazil. Thank you for taking time to listen. Um, my wife, Joanna, is the, is, a, is the music teacher at Travis Elementary. Uh, I'm also speaking on behalf of Lindsay Reyes, a kindergarten teacher at Travis Elementary. Uh, today they were informed that uh, their children will not be able to attend school with them. And I understand the reasons for it. I'm not here to try and change your mind. But I am here to talk about how this district cares for its teachers. Raises are a good thing and it needs to happen. And I mean, no one's a stranger to the fact that this district doesn't pay as much as the other districts around Central Texas. It's not an envious position to be in. But the teachers in this district do more with less than any other teachers in Texas. I'm convinced. Um, my wife has been a teacher at Travis for 10 years. She's been a CIT team leader for five of those years. She's raised $5,000 in grants in the last two years to pay for musical instruments for her children because there were none when she got there. Um, she's started an honor choir called the Troublemakers. You may have seen them either in person or on TV. They've been on TV twice bringing great recognition to this district. But she can't bring her, my, my son, EJ, who's gonna be a kindergartner next year, can't do it because Travis is at capacity. I'm so glad this community voted for the bond. 
to address critical capacity needs. But at the same time, when my wife called today to figure out, is there anything that can be done? Here's the thing, we live in New Braunfels. I work at 1.30 in the morning. I'm normally asleep right now. I can't be there to take my child to school. <coughs> she has to drop her child off, my EJ off at seven o'clock in New Braunfels. School starts here at 7.45. We also have an infant son that has to be taken to daycare. It's physically impossible for her to be at school at 7.45. Or when teachers are supposed to be there, which is before school, she can't walk in when the bell starts, you know? So when she called today asking, are you telling me that I have to find another job? The response she was given was, I can't tell you what to do. Now to me, for a district that is considering raises for teachers, talking about doing the most with the money for their students, to how much it cares about their teachers, the response is, I can't tell you what to do, is pretty disrespectful to me. My wife has dedicated 10 years, a third of her life to this district. She was recognized as an emerging leader two years ago by this district. This district helped pay for her master's degree to train her to become an administrator. She's getting her PhD now in educational leadership on her own, has never wanted to leave this district, but today was told, can't tell you what to do. Lindsey Reyes is another teacher, kindergarten teacher. Mr. Brazil, um, if you can finish your statement, please, your three okay. minutes is up. Real quick, her daughter has autism, was told today she can't come to her school, was told after a month of ARDS, preparing her daughter to go to Travis Elementary, was told, no, she's gonna go to Bowie. Bowie does not have a focus program yet. They haven't hired the teacher for that program. It doesn't exist at the moment. It will in the fall, but the teachers at Bowie, the gen ed teachers have not been trained on how to deal with special needs students. Not like Lily, who's already been taken to Travis, shown around. You're gonna take a special needs student and up in their life and change just willy nilly because the district isn't willing to help those two teachers in any, in any, in any way possible. I know the decision's been made. I just want people to know that it's really disrespectful to people that have donated their part half their lives almost to the students of this community. Thank you. Thank you. Our fourth speaker, Susan Seaton. Good evening, board members and members of the community. My name is Susan Seaton and I'm president of the San Marcos Educators Association. I want to talk to you tonight about teacher raises. We have this conversation each year. We sit at the board workshops and we listen to the pros, the cons, the financial um, state of our district. We talk about whether there's a deficit budget or not. We talk about the numbers. We talk about projections. We talk about students. We talk about student academics. We talk about where we want to go. I want to talk to you tonight about the 20% of teachers that leave our district every single year. When we talk about raises for this year, TASB came in and did an update. One of the, the key statements that the TASB member made said that San Marcos teachers are grossly underpaid. That resonated with me. I even wrote it down in quotes because that's what he said in the presentation. I want you to realize for every teacher that leaves, it costs between seven and $9,000 to bring in another teacher, put them through the mentorship program, put them through the GT program, put them through all of the training that is required to make a great teacher in San Marcos for our students. Wouldn't that money be better spent with the teachers that are already here giving their service to this district? I am urging you to please consider the 3% raise. I understand that you are going to be presented with the 2.5% raise as the recommendation. There's only a $200,000 difference between the 2.5 and the 3% raise. I believe that our teachers are worth it. I believe that we need to invest in the teachers that are giving their service to our district. When many of our teachers 
In fact, over half have less than eight years of service, either in the teaching industry or to our district. You can't talk about raising the bar. You can't talk about better test scores. You can't talk about high expectations and rigor if you are continually having a workforce that turns over. When your veteran teachers are leaving your district to go to the neighboring towns because they do pay more. Now our starting salary is the same as many of the other districts around us. When you move to the 10 year mark, it is not the same. When you move to the 15 or the 20 year mark, it is very much not the same. We talked last year about a compression schedule adjustment. We talked about redoing it so that our teachers can be making what's comparable so that people will stay in San Marcos. We've talked about brainstorming and bringing up incentives to keep people in San Marcos. It is time to invest the money in the teachers that are here and keeping them here. I am urging you to please consider and vote for the 3% raise for our, our staff. Thank you. Our fifth and last speaker, Rob Rourke. Good evening, Rob Rourke, 1804 800. Uh, board <laughs> members and superintendent, uh, I'm going to go off of my speech for just a quick second. You have just authorized an investment in our future. Remember that the teachers are investment too. Come up with a solution for this, okay? Figure out something. If you've got families and they're here and they wanna work here, take care of them, okay? I wasn't gonna say anything, but you know, he did real well. All right, on to my speech. Well, it's already done, but I am here to protest the election canvassing. Even though you've already accepted the results, you know, I have not been vocal for or against the bonds. This isn't about any of that, okay? But as a voter, a taxpayer, a parent, a longtime resident, I question the transparency of this election to the voting public. On the Saturday after elections at seven o'clock, if you tried to log in and to find any of these election results anywhere, they were not to be found. If you went to the school district site, you couldn't find anything. If you went to the county site, you couldn't find anything. I found out from my friend David Short that's with one of the uh, media through the back door, the results. I still don't have all of the results because it's hidden. You all contract out to the county for this. You are using our taxpayer dollars. Make sure that you are getting what we deserve. Last fall, the county lost 1,800 votes, did not get counted. It was only through the back door that we found this out. We've been working with the county to try to come up with some solutions. I was promised back in March that they would have an independent audit. I work for a steel company that does uh, nuclear uh, pieces that go into nuclear power plants, all sorts of things. I have an audit going on this week. Every year, I have to go through and show my processes and my procedures. The county is not doing that. You, by contracting with the county and running an election, are doing just the same thing. I want accountability, I want transparency for all of these people in the room. I'm not questioning the results because I don't have anything to know whether I can question them or not. We've already canvassed, but before you do another election, Let's get this stuff straight. Let's get the school district site. If you're gonna have an election, don't rely on somebody else. You, you go in there and it's buried PDF files. There's nowhere if people needed to know how to vote. I know because people ask me. This is what I do in the community. I'm an activist. I get out there and I try to help people. <clears throat> people do not trust the vote locally. Please help me to change that and change that with the county. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move up uh, executive session because our attorney is here. And uh, so we're going to go into executive session right now. Is that item number seven and uh, 12? Yes. Item 12, A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. 
to reconvene and begin our, our votes. We're going to take our votes on items A and C from executive session. I'm ready for a motion. I move to authorize the school council and the administration to negotiate and enter into the OCR resolution agreement in regard to complaint number 06-16-1786 as discussed in closed session. Want to hear a second? I'll second. Any further? Dis no, we can't discuss. All in favor? 7 0. C. Discuss hiring of assistant principal at San Marcos High School. Madam President, I make a motion that we approve Mr. Daniel S. Gonzalez to be assistant principal at San Marcos High School. I'll second. Ms. Hanson seconds. All in favor? 7 0. I'm going to take a... Uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Who is he? Mr. Gonzalez. There you go. Just stand up. Oh, I just said just stand up. Don't know who you are. <laughs> Welcome. This you. Is, I, I'm, I'm uh, proud to join the team. Would you like to introduce your family? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's my wife, Marissa. <laughs> my son, Max. And my daughter, Mia. All right. Nice Good family. Job. We're going to take... Welcome aboard, and we're going to take a, a little break right now for about 10 minutes, and then we'll start back with items 9 through 11. 721 maybe? Yep. Wrote it down 721. 721. Okay, we're ready. Reconvene. We're ready for academic update. Good evening. As discussed earlier, uh, Ms. Hernsberger is our Director of Innovative Programs, Data and Accountability, and ILSs and librarians fall under her domain. Throughout this year, Ms. Hernsberger has held uh, multiple meetings with our ILSs and librarians as they've reviewed the processes of what falls under uh, their category. And throughout these uh, sessions, they've come up with a list of responsibilities. Uh, through our conversations and dialogue that we've had and as we spoke about agenda prep one of our main priorities is to um, take away the inventory from the librarians and ILS so they can focus on instruction and collaborating with teachers and working on research with the students and integrating the technology into the classrooms and really being part of that planning process with the next steps I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ms. Hernsberg so she can go ahead and talk through this. So we really want to focus on 21st century instruction, which means getting our kids leading the way, focus on what they're interested in. That means maker spaces, that means technology, that means the librarians really getting in there and supporting the kids and the teachers as they plan that, not just as some special thing that happens in the library, but in all the classrooms. And we really want to focus on that increase in literacy, and that is technology literacy as well as literacy like you would think of traditionally with books. Mm -hmm. And all of our librarians are getting their Google Educator certification, librarians and ILSs, this June. We're excited about that. And they'll be having common planning periods with content teachers. That's, that's a big deal that I saw when I got to the Texas Library Association conference that I got to attend a few weeks ago 
that's happening all over the state where people get so busy that the librarians don't get to go in and support the teachers and we're going to work on that with our teachers so that they really do have that time to support students and teachers interacting with ILSs and librarians goes along with that and then updating and modernizing the Lexile libraries. We've already ordered books for that. Any questions? Questions? Are we going to share with the, the public libraries also? Yeah. We can. They might like an update. Sure. We'll get with Ms. Smith. Thank you. <coughs> Technology update. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Cardona, Greg Hubenak, Director of Technology. And it has on the agenda that there's going to be a technology update. Uh, of course, I could stand up here and I could talk for hours and <laughs> actually enjoy it. But the, <laughs> the, um, the topic that I believe is of the most interest uh, and that we're, my very brief presentation is going to cover tonight is uh, the state of Wi-Fi uh, for SMC ISD. <clears throat> so I thought the easiest way to go through this would be to talk briefly about the recent activities and what we've done to maintain a robust Wi-Fi infrastructure, what that looks like today, and then also uh, what future upgrades are planned. So with that, uh, previous Wi-Fi upgrades, uh, in order to stay current, uh, we went back as far as 2012, didn't feel any need to go back before that, uh, which coincides with the time where there were more mobile devices coming into the district. We upgraded uh, all six elementaries, uh, Mendez, uh, De Zavala, Travis, Hernandez, Crockett, and Bowie, uh, with 216 access points. AP on this slide uh, stands for access point. Um, so there's the things on the ceiling that we connect to with Wi-Fi, which is on average about 36 per campus. Now that's not the same number on every campus because the campus layout and the size is very much different, but on average about 36. Not quite an access point in every classroom. Um, that's kind of a gold standard, and if you were a one-to-one -one district, you would definitely want something like that, but close to it. But what we did do during that project is we did install uh, cables for future locations for access point in every classroom to, be, to make it much easier when the time came that we needed to put those access points in place. In 2014, uh, we did a large secondary push, all secondary campuses. Uh, we increased the high school from 47 access points to 125. Uh, Goodnight Middle School from 25 to 78 and Miller from 17 to 48. And again, um, we felt like that was adequate to provide enough coverage uh, for what was needed, what was happening on those campuses. Uh, but again, putting the cables in every classroom for uh, future growth. And since then, uh, we've built several new facilities and of course we've had to install uh, Wi-Fi in those buildings, and, and those buildings are in pretty good shape right now with modern equipment. So the current state is 575 wireless access points across the district. And so let's take a look at what that looks like on an example campus. So if you're looking at a floor print, this is the first floor in the academic wing of the high school, and this is where all the access points currently are. As you can see, there's quite a few. There's not one in every classroom. The, the least covered area is probably where uh, the science labs are, but they're hands-on in those classrooms. So these are strategically placed. There's a bunch in the library. Um, but again, you can, if you look close enough, see every now and then there's a classroom without one in, in the room, but it, the classroom is still covered. There are plenty of access points around that space. The second floor of the academic wing looks pretty pretty thick as well. So if you imagine that space, you've got one floor and another right above it, quite a few access points covering that area uh, for our students. Uh, and definitely we feel more than enough to support what they're actually doing and what technology they have on the campuses. And even in support of bring your own device, you know, we, we know that they're connecting their own devices to those access points as well. The uh, fine arts and athletics side of the campus is a little bit more sparse, but still pretty well blanketed. <laughs> But I provided these maps simply as a, a visual depiction of the type of density that we put into our current campuses. One access point 
you know, the question may come up, well, how many devices can you connect to an access point? And the answer, those are our favorite answers, it depends. It depends <laughs> on what you're doing, right? Uh, it's not uncommon to have 50, 60, or 70 devices that can associate, but that many devices can't be streaming live video all at the same time. If you've got very active users, a good planning radius is more at below 40, 35, 30, um, you know, or even right under that for the best experience, which is why one per classroom is a good planning range. So moving forward, well, actually, let's take a look at the high school again. I know these numbers are hard to see, so I'll read them out to you. This is one week of Wi-Fi activity at San Marcos High School. And it says uh, under client uh, stats, uh, total unique clients that we've seen in one week, 3,100 wireless devices connecting to the network. On average, clients per day, it says that's 2,300 on Tuesday, 2,341 on Wednesday, up to 2,325 or 35 on Friday. So that many unique devices connecting every day. Just because you're connecting doesn't mean you're doing a whole lot. Well, we actually ran the usage stats as well, and quite a bit of use is coming from those connections. Uh, if you know your cell phone data plan, I don't know what size plan you have, a 10 gig plan or a 30 gig plan. I have a 30 gig plan, which is kind of small for my family of four, uh, and we pretty much go right at it every month. Well, 1,000 gigs, gigabytes of data, is a terabyte. So in one week's time, uh, we're well over 3.5 terabytes of data flowing to and from the internet through our access points. So it tells me they're not only connecting but they're accessing content. So looking forward, uh, there are a lot of changes in the Wi-Fi access point realm, right? So I don't know if you know what type you have at home. It may be 802.11n or b or g. Uh, these are different Wi-Fi standards. They change all the time. Uh, you're probably on g or n, but there are new standards. Uh, AC is the latest ratified standard, and they're constantly changing so we kind of have to stay ahead of that as well future upgrades that we have planned greg i'm sorry before you go to the next slide i had a question miss can too will you i guess just for my understanding what's the difference between the three wi-fi names at the bottom like so, who uses those three separate wi-fi accounts router wi-fi is the bring your own device network mm -hmm. okay. so uh, whether it's your own personally owned ipad laptop um, iphone <laughs> samsung phone whatever it is um, it is your own device, and you're connecting to the network, and it could be for use, it's intended to be used in the classroom as an instructional aid. But it's, it's present um, as a service uh, for people to connect to. Uh, I think by and large nowadays when you go somewhere, you do expect you will have Wi-Fi access. And so we make it easy for visitors as well. Instead of going through a multi-day process to sign up and, and get someone a password, uh, they're able to access, and it's, a, it's secured from our network, but it does provide access to the internet. And the other two? The handheld devices uh, used especially a lot at the uh, elementaries, like the iPads and Kindles and Chromebooks uh, connect to that network, and SMCISD is almost exclusively uh, for like teacher laptops or anyone with a district-issued laptop or MacBook. So not a lot of those types of devices are really in the hands of students now. It's, it's, it's using different things. They're using Chrome, Chrome boxes or, or lab PCs and things of that nature. So the SMHS Wi-Fi clients for one week is at the top, but the Wi-Fi network usage is for the entire district at the bottom on this slide, or is that still just San Marcos High School data? This is San Marcos High School. Okay. Future upgrades, uh, tw uh, which we're moving into as soon as summer hits, uh, and we're, we're funding this uh, with E-rate reimbursements. So there's federal reimbursements that helps pay for internet access as well as getting that internet access to your staff and students. Uh, so a lot of this equipment to provide Wi-Fi is subsidized by uh, the FCC through USAC. We will be upgrading Mendez, De Zavala, Travis, and Hernandez because they are on a, a different uh, brand. Uh, to get them up to the district standard and also to bring them up to the latest technology, which again I mentioned earlier was is AC, 802.11 AC. 
uh, replacing one for one. So although we're not adding access points, that campus will still those campuses will still see a boost in functionality. Uh, all campus networks are receiving routers. This is the equipment in the main networking closet, um, and some of the network throughout the building to help pave the way to connect these wireless access points too. We have to power those devices from the network. So we're doing that prep work early in the summer. A project that uh, I'm working with Ms. Griffith to try to expedite is what I call 2017 part two. And that is next E-rate year, year 17, 18, we will be receiving more funds uh, for what we call category two equipment. Um, and we're gonna bring, try to bring that early into the summer so we can hit the all secondary campuses. Upgrading the high school from 125 access points to 168, good night from 76 to 116, and Miller from 48 to 75. It'll be a full replacement, brand new networks at secondaries, uh, and we will be reclaiming 150 of the better equipment from those campuses for redistribution to the elementaries. <clears throat> so with the 17-18 E-rate funds, we will then bring all the, the campuses up to a full standard, again, collectively across all six elementaries, bringing the total count from 216 up to 344, uh, bringing the campus averages up to 57 per elementary campus. And that is really um, where we are with Wi-Fi and SMCISD. I did want to highlight uh, something that folks may not really know, but in the Student Responsible Technology Use Agreement, uh, there is this clause in here. It says, by accepting the privilege of possessing or using personally owned electronic computing storage or communication devices, your phone, your tablet, uh, you will only utilize district provider wireless networks to access internet information. Uh, and the reason for that is if we are sanctioning the use of personally owned devices in the classroom, we need to filter the, those devices for internet content. And so that is a general clause that you'll see a lot of districts have. It says, a matter of policy, if you're bringing your own devices, to, to work or to school, then you will use our provided wireless networks. A question, Mr. McLaughlin. I do. Is there something you can do to amplify the carrier signals within the building? That seems like it would defer some of the load on the Wi-Fi network, and like my AT&T doesn't work like in at least three quarters of the high school from what I can tell. I don't, I don't really know how we would go about that with like contacting AT&T and convincing them that they need to put a tower somewhere to provide more service uh, that would penetrate the, the, the bricks and the metal of the building. As far as providing I thought you could boost those signals with something inside the facility. The, the only thing that I've actually seen done before is a personally owned device that can attach to Wi-Fi and provide your own personal little cell phone signal. Um, and those are things that can be purchased, again, like if you needed it in your house, if you didn't have good coverage, then you could do that in your home. But from a getting into the business of helping people access their 4G cellular networks is actually counter to what we're trying to accomplish with this, which is your, the primary use, the assumption is the BYU, OD networks are provided with the intent of supplementing SMCISD instructional activities. So well, I, wasn't, said, I, wasn't, I wasn't really asking for a policy reason not to do it. I was talking about a technical answer to if that can be done. I think in airports and certain places, the carriers do things like that, but it's not really within any standard activity that, that we would find ourselves doing. I mean, it's it's a network run by the carriers and, and money paid to the carriers. So it would, I don't know of any other districts that are doing it. Um, it seems a little uh, unorthodox. So we've not done a lot of research around it. Right, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Right, thank you. First reading of the GKA Local Community Relations Policy Area. Good evening, board members. Uh, this evening I want to share with you, this is a, a first reading of uh, GKA Local Board Policy Update. Uh, we had um, 
several instances this school year um, when we had to reference board policy on terms of how we proceed and what we've noticed was in several areas dealing in areas of civility disruption in the audiovisual category area um, that we had several gaps in our current policy the way it's currently constructed and so uh, we worked with our district council with coming up with some suggestions that we can provide you all for you to consider to strengthen our policy um, reference in those areas we had the opportunity to look at that and uh, this is just for first reading this evening uh, I would love to answer any questions that you may have um, and with, with the hopes of um, having this approved at the June meeting. Questions or comments from the board? I guess um, a lot of this seems to be covered already. So was there specific gaps and what are they? I'm concerned about where our policy runs into the First Amendment and, and an understanding that that area of school discipline, sorry, uh, is a specific carve out from your general right of First Amendment free speech. But that specific carve out, there's like 6,000 court cases that define where that line is and where it isn't. So I'm hesitant to redraw that ourselves, you know, without being mindful of its implication um, in that regard. So is there, did y'all consider a more narrow policy to specifically target the type of behavior you were looking to curtail? Or, and did you relate the restriction on speech with something to do with school discipline specifically? Does, did you draw that line? Because I think that, at least from my understanding, that's the line that the court kind of insists on. Sure is a good question. Um, what, when you talked about the, the types of speech, the type of speech that we're referencing is the type of speech that's considered disruptive, abusive language, abusive tone, abusive posture, uh, being on, on places where you're restricted, things of that nature. Um, so we're talking about really negative situations. Um, and what we're asking for here in this policy is, is just to have a, just a, like an incident report and a protocol that we can follow when we are, again, faced with those type of situations. Okay. And then, of course, as you know, we've had multiple instances of student recording other students um, involving in, you know, inappropriate activity. And so we, we didn't really have a, we really currently don't have a board policy in this area that addresses that. Yeah, well, some of that was in follow-up and then I'll yield. Uh, you know, a lot of that video, or some of that video activity actually brought to light things going on in the facility that those of us on the outside would not have been aware of and brought special attention that might have been negative in the short run but could have led to long-term positive policy change. So I don't know that more information is necessarily bad. I'll, I know Ann and some of my colleagues have a question. I just want to say I'm going to oppose this this evening, um, but I would, could probably be talked into it if it removed the phrase uses loud or offensive language that could provoke a violent reaction because I don't think a speaker's speech should be judged upon the reaction it has upon the hearer. I think rather it should be, you know, stand on its own. So that's the phrase that I took some exception to. But other than that, I could get behind some of the more specific stuff. I don't think we're voting on it. This is just information. This is just an information. Oh, I thought we were doing a first reading. We're not it's voting. Done. This is just first reading this evening. Okay. Yeah. Well, I vote then, anyway. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Halsey? So I was just wondering if we right. adopted the language for the yes. policy from TASB or from some other source, or if it came from our uh, board lawyer, or if it was generated internally. It's a combination from all of them, uh, all the things you just mentioned. We work with uh, Mr. Cruz and his associates on this, but we did uh, do some of the basis from our policy from other districts. Thank you. Anyone else have a yes, Ms. Cantu. Started on the so on the audio and video recording, it's page 20 of our board book, 202 of the policy recommendation. I guess my question is, if I was a student at San Marcos High School and I videotaped a fight occurring at lunch and I posted that somewhere and a bunch of people saw it, am I liable to, I mean, have disciplinary action taken against yes. me, although I did not 
participate. perpetrate the fight, but because I recorded it and posted it on social media. Yes, sir. Okay, well, on that basis alone, I I just can't fundamentally support that type of policy change. I understand that it might violate a student's right or FERPA or anything like that, but posting a video of someone else breaking the rules, again, I think I found out my first year on the board of fights at the high school, not from the administration itself, not this current administration, but the former administration via YouTube links sent to me by parents or students. and. Unfortunately, in this day and age, I can't penalize a student for posting a video to, I mean, I just can't do that. But any, if it changes in some way or removes that punishment clause from other students, then I might be able to support this at a later date. Any other well, comments? Too? I mean, what that punishment might look like. In terms of a student that did a recording similar right. to what Ms. Rodano has mentioned. If you could um, bring that ba information back. Yeah, I'll bring I'll provide that information for you. Ms. Costilla, I just want to pose a question. Mm, following up on Mr. McLaughlin and Mr. Adelondo's um, comments, what, what, is, what is the intent of these, this thing that is this being presented to us? What, what, is, what generated, what has happened that it, it, we're here where we're at? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I think we're trying to change the culture of the district, right? We're trying to give our principals uh, the opportunity to create a culture where they can run a safe campus. And, you know, I would respectfully disagree with Mr. Adondo in saying that, you know, if a kid is, is uploading, first of all, minors and violating FERPA and uploading it onto YouTube, regardless of his intent of how we find it, I think we have to empower our principals to be able to hold those kids accountable in order to change the culture of the district. And that's one of the things I was charged with, was changing the culture of this district and student safety is one of them. Like I get, you know, the free speech part and I get the, you know, I respectfully get the, the part about, um, you know, not getting involved, but when you have students um, that are purposely damaging the culture or when you have parents who purposely walk onto a campus you know on Facebook live and are cussing staff members you know that's a problem to me and I'm going to recommend a policy that I think will help us change the culture because I think once we start and, and by the way this isn't coming necessarily from the adults on in the building I've met with students in the student advisory board where they want at the high school in particular to take a harsh stance around some of these behaviors. So it's not Mr. Cardona talking. It's your straight A students that are like, we have got to do something to change the culture in this district. And when kids are videotaping fights and are yelling, fight, 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 I think that kid loses his right to, you know, in some cases, be on that campus for a while. And, you know, it just is a way to get that principle to, you know, have something to say enough's enough. And so, you know, we had a period of about a month where we had several issues in that high school campus and we had a parent go off and I don't think our employees, we talked, we had an employee come and, parent come and chastise us about culture and so we're trying to put something in to protect, you know, our employees and give them teeth. Not just the principals, but in general, all the teachers on the, in the campus. So, well, Mr. Mr. Brief reply. I can get behind a policy change and understand the purpose. I just want to make sure it's as narrowly tailored as possible because all abusive policies start with good intentions. Oh, we're just trying to do, we're trying to protect teachers. Oh, we're trying to protect administration. And I believe that you are. But when the language is too broad, it could later be used by different individuals in different places to punish things that I don't think we have a business and we might violate the Constitution by punishing. So I, I would welcome a revised version of this and hope that I can mm -hmm. support it. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you. We're good. Brings us to the approval of consent agenda items, approval of minutes. We've already done personnel action. Consider acceptance of donation from Crockett Elementary PTO and consideration and approval of non-administrative professional personnel contracts. Uh, Ms. Cantu, I make a motion that we approve the consent agenda items as presented. All in favor? A second. Oh, sorry, second. <laughs> All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Moving on to items for action. Consider approval of budget amendments. Um, 
Um, in your packet on starting on page 27 is the uh, budget amendment as presented. Um, there are two, a budget amendment 16 and 17 that are being presented tonight. I make a motion that we approve the May budget amendments as presented. Do I hear a second? I'll second the motion. Ms. Viapando seconds. Any discussion? Yeah, I continue to have concerns about our ballooning legal expenses. Um, I mean, we had some specific information provided by the administration, um, but this is something we have to deal with in the budget season. Mm -hmm. And once we're out of budgeted money, you know, by department, we have to self-discipline that a little bit more. And I feel weird with me, the one complaining about lawyer fees. But, um, <laughs> but this is the most common one we get of the most significant volume. So I, we have to pay our bills, so I'm going to vote for it, but very hesitantly. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Anybody else? Are we ready to vote? All in favor? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <coughs> Consideration possible approval of TASB update 107. Good evening again, board members. Um, this is our policy 107 update. That's uh, policies recommended by TASB. There was 10 policies that they felt uh, for a local board mm -hmm. policies that should be updated because of uh, litigation, federal, state uh, rulings, or legal precedent. And so uh, we had the first reading in April and answered several questions uh, that you had. but. I would love to answer any remaining questions that you may have regarding this policy update. We have our entire policy team here, so if you have any questions regarding any specific policy, we'd be more than happy to address those this evening. Mr. McLaughlin. So following up with the question I had at the April meeting, I, I wanted a little more information on, um, I understand the current policy with regard to when a parent looks to withdraw their child and homeschool them, they have to file. They just file a statement with the with the school. This seemed to be a bit more invasive in that it could be demanded maybe for a supplemental statement at another time, and it seemed to create a little bit of a expectation that the district at least could monitor the sort of curriculum being administered to those students outside of our control um, and tied to the compulsory attendance. So I was hoping that maybe. Y'all could explain how that works now and how this, and allay my concerns that this is a change. Okay. Uh, Ms. Lugo, or, okay. Mr. Barton, thank you. I don't believe our practice is going to change substantially. Uh, this aligns our PEAMS coding with our board policy. So we've traditionally asked the question uh, when parents tell us um, we're going to homeschool our child, do you have the resources that you need? and they usually indicate yes, and they sign the letter that says, I'm going to begin homeschooling my child on such and such a date. That's the PEAM standard for coding a homeschool student. Uh, this just formalizes that in our policy. Okay, and do we know how many we have currently district resident students that are homeschooling? I can answer that more narrowly. Uh, 47 students this year have left our district to be homeschooled. Okay, all right, thanks. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Mr. Redondo. Make a motion that we approve the TASB update 107 as presented by staff. I hear a second. I'll second. Palsy seconds. All in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, drew, I doodled on it. I'll just take it with me. night we had a budget workshop where we uh, started going over what um, our recommendation for salary models will be for the 17-18 school year and part of the initiative of this year was to try and adopt a salary schedule sooner so that we can attract teachers and other staff and they would know what their salary was going to be before 
um, they moved on to another district. So we did hire TASB to do um, some salary um, studies for us and make recommendations as far as what they would recommend for our district for compensation to, um, to our teachers, uh, clerical professional, auxiliary, and administrative professionals. And so before you, you have two different options in which they are um, recommending. The first one is a 2.5% increase, and the second one is a 3% increase. So in your packet, on the next page, you will see the 3%, and with the, uh, which I thought member was on the uh, um, salary plan that we presented uh, last Monday, you'll see the additional um, adjustments that are in years two through six and nine through 11. And so um, with these recommended changes, it goes in to help the uh, difference that you see in the very right hand column. So the difference between the steps. So basically what we do every year is we adopt a new hiring schedule. Okay, so that, that's what our district does every year. And so um, you have um, a 3% and then that'll show you, the next page shows you the hiring guide and then uh, model two is the 2.5% and what that would look for as the new hire guide for those um, two two different salary ranges. Um, also, so what that would mean for all other classifications is they would get either the 2.5 or the 3% based on midpoint. So what we've done is we've given you um, what the new um, proposed compensation plan would be for an administrative professional, um, uh, the clerical professional and the manual trades. So you'll see what it was in 2016. And this isn't what the race, the, um, this is the um, proposed changes that they've made to these um, categories, what they're recommending that the new minimum go, you know, it's not, you're not gonna see a whole lot, um, but uh, you are gonna see um, some changes in those. And you will see um, on pay grade one, um, that's not a typo, it went from 228 down to 224, but that's because they added in a step nine. So they uh, kind of made adjustments to the salary plan. So I didn't want you to think, wait a minute, we're going from 228 to 224 on the administrative professionals that um, I just wanted to make that aware. And it was because they've made a new uh, um, pay grade, which is a nine, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then also um, after those are the uh, stipend plans. So we uh, put together the 1617 and the proposed 1718 so you can see the difference. Um, the only thing that we did add in those proposed plans were the um, new stipends for the math teachers at 1500, uh, uh, science teachers 1500, the special ed uh, focused and ACL at uh, 1500, and then at all your special ed aides would move up from pay grade two to a pay grade three. And so those additional, um, that additional uh, cost is at uh, 200, uh, 289,000 and that was added to the stipend amount that you see on the first page for the TASB recommendations in both models. Questions, comments? Uh, yes, Redondo? Karen, or Mrs. Griffith and Mr. Watson. My two questions are in regards to the most, I guess the last, the second and third to last pages, the clerical and paraprofessional proposed compensation plan and the manual trades proposed compensation plan. The decreases in the maximum amount, I guess in that hiring range, is that a result of the TASB study? And which one? The decreases in the maximum amount from year to year, so pay grade one, maximum was 1652, in 2017, 18, it's 1620, and it kind of consistently does that for all pay grades on that page. Um, and I believe the reason why they did it is because they added a pay grade eight. They added another pay grade in there, so they kind of shifted some. And then in their recommendation on some of those adjustments, you'll see they move people from one pay grade up to another. So they made some pay grade changes, and with that, they recommended these different min, min, and max categories. Um, to fit into those structures. But for the positions that are in pay grade one, they're never gonna go to pay grade two because that position is always coded as pay grade one, correct? Correct. So adding the additional scale doesn't affect a person on tier one, it just spreads the money w within another step, correct? Yeah, let me just, just okay. comment real quick without 
talking about a whole bunch of HR nerd mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, with how you develop these salary structures is, ba is based on midpoint offsets. Mm -hmm. And so we have between a 40 and 50 percent midpoint offset. I think he had mentioned to me, uh, Tasby had mentioned that they had shrunk the offsets slightly. It's best practice not to have that wide of a range in certain categories, best practice wise. And so um, while they were working through this review for us, they in some areas contracted the midpoint off offset just a tad. Okay. And so the 2017 18, as presented in all of these pay scales, represents. I'm sorry, does it represent a percentage increase already approved by the board or these numbers will change based on the vote that we do tonight? This is just the salary structure, compensation right. plan structure. This this structure here has, um, only thing it has to do with the raise is whatever the midpoint is, mm -hmm. is the, it's, whatever the new midpoint is decided is where the raise will be determined from. Okay. So. And we didn't make any changes from what task we proposed on these structures. Additional questions? I guess I do. Yes. I guess I Mr. McLaughlin? It's very nitpicky. Sorry. I'm apologizing in advance. I'm going to talk about an individual stipend. Newcomer center teacher bilingual. $2,500 before, $2,500 after. Is that the same? I mean, it seems like all the other bilingual teachers moved from a, they got about an additional $1,500 stipend. Is there something unique about the newcomer center or what those teachers do? You're talking about the high school? I don't the, know what I'm talking about. I'm just see, reading it. Let's see. Let me, <laughs> you, know, you know what, you know what, what page, page you're on? You on? Uh, uh, let's see. Page. Next, Next to last, last page. page. Yeah. I believe that's a newcomer center at the high school uh, that we have stipend. Uh, Dr. Turbo, do you know? You got a second to come up here? Okay. 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 Oh, ben. ben can do it. He's closer. <laughs> ben knows. Thanks, Mr. Yes. Alba. Can you ben explain what, about that role of the Newcomer Center? Yes. At, at the so high the Newcomer uh, Center, we have uh, currently two teachers there. And the high school has seen an increase in uh, newcomer students. And um, currently we have um, a staff that is, has been overburdened with the amount of students that we've, we've been getting. And to become competitive, I believe that that's uh, a competitive uh, amount to uh, to receive as a stipend with with our teachers. Yeah, uh, I would agree with you, but it didn't change, at least on my copy. It, it was 2,500 before and it's it 2,500 2, after, right but now. it seems like all the other bilingual teachers, there was an increase. So I'm just trying to determine why, if that was intentionally left out, and if so, what was the reason? Right, and so, one of the things that we looked at was making sure that we're um, compatible with, with other high schools that run the same program. Um, we Initially, we, we could say they, they can receive an, an increase, but I think based on the, on the, yeah. on the TASB's recommendation, it was... Are these basic, people teaching classes like the other bilingual mm -hmm. teachers? Absolutely, yes. Yes, and they actually have uh, students who are, this is a different challenge because these are students who are in high school and have their primary language is typically Spanish. And so um, they have to catch them up. Uh, and these are. I'm wondering why they're not getting the $4,000 stipend. Why, like why aren't they getting the 4000 is the big question. I maybe they weren't teaching classes well, or something. The, the only difference is when you're talking about bilingual certification and ESL certification, those two different types of certification. Um, the only certification you need at the high school is an ESL certification. Um, and that is basically what reflects here. Um, so the bilingual certification takes a little bit more. Um, so for instance, an ESL teacher doesn't have to necessarily talk or speak in Spanish, okay? So these newcomer teachers do not speak Spanish? Or just they ESL don't. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, so they don't okay. have to, okay. yeah. Okay. So if they did, if they were bilingual certified, they would get the stipend bump yes. that we saw previously? Okay, yes. That okay, that answers my question. I, okay. I don't know I'm sorry that place. I just was wondering. I think they okay. brought that up when we had the TASB presentation, the lady that came and presented and she was saying the certifications were harder more and difficult, that's why they, they would be able to earn more, more in money. terms of their stipend. Mm -hmm. Right, that was on that presentation. Right, me too. Yes. Okay. Certifications are different okay. in that. Yes. Okay, Mr. McLaughlin. Mr. Watson. Mr. Yes. Watson, and you may not have this information right in your head, but I'm curious how Try. many uh, <laughs> manual trade or clerical, 
paraprofessional employees we have who earn less than $12 an hour. Less than $12. Can you give me that information? I like cannot in provide a, that for you in, at a later, like no, tomorrow. Okay. Oh, okay. I, mm -hmm. have I, I have it too. I mean, I don't have it tonight. But I, I mean, I don't need it like now, but before I vote it, that'd be great. Okay. <laughs> I can I have a bike. So we're going to wait laptop, on the vote. No, I'm not trying to delay anything. It's just we <laughs> thought it was possible they'd have that information. I don't have any more questions. Then. Okay. Who else had questions? Someone on this side? Any other questions? Just, I, can, I guess one clarification. Mr. Redondo? I guess this is for Mrs. Griffith, possibly, because it's the dollar amount. So with adjustments, is the compression fixes that were presented at a previous board meeting? Um, TASB recommended. So you'll see that in the adjustment column that's that this TASB sheet. Mm -hmm. This is what they're recommending in the amounts in those particular areas. Okay. But so would it be safe to say that that fixes compression for the pay scale in general, or is it just oh, addressing <laughs> two through 11? Thanks, Karen. Mr. Watson. Uh, it, it, uh, good question. It, it um, corrects the matter um, slightly, um, not, not completely. There will still be some compression. We're definitely we're headed the right way of kind of smoothing out those steps um, figuratively. And so um, it, it's definitely, you know, the 3% model um, smooths them out even more. But uh, the 2.5 heads in the right direction, and they made specific uh, actions. That's why they had some of the adjustments that they have in place is to kind of correct some of those steps. As a follow-up question, I guess if we stay on this track, I mean, obviously our neighboring districts approve pay raises every year, like we do. Mm -hmm. I guess at what point in time, doing these minor adjustments, would could we safely say that compression? was fixed or, I mean, because you say we, you know, we take a step in the right direction on this, yes. but how many more steps do we have to take to get to where we, I guess, technically should be? Uh, it just depends on how aggressive and how much we want to spend, to be perfectly honest. Um, so, you know, I, that's something that I'm very keenly aware of. I've, I've uh, my first year here, I realized that, that was a very big, very big concern for the community. And so uh, that's one of the first things we shared with TASB when we consulted with them was, hey, you know, we need this to be reviewed and, and we have an issue with our steps being unequal and not, not smooth as it should be. Um, and so uh, they looked into that and, and they addressed it as, as best as they could uh, within the monies. I have a question. Ms. Costilla. Mr. Watson, um, <clears throat> the last time that we got this, it was up to step 38, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. And so now we have it up to step 24. Fine. Is that correct? So right. was, what was the major difference? I mean, and I know what I had asked for that, really, yes. in these steps. Well, we, we'll still have the 38. I want to make that very clear for the record that our, our senior uh, veteran teachers will still get the increase right. and, yes, we and all that. But, that. but um, we just, so the answer to your, your question was, why did we go to the 20? Well, no, 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 I, I wanted it, okay. I wanted it to see, but I'm just wondering because of the, the, the amounts that were here. Yes. What, what was the, was there a major difference in these amounts in these steps? Uh, no, ma'am. Well, no? No, ma'am. What we just did, we just we just stopped it at 25. Taz, we proposed a step schedule that had all the way down to 39. Oh, 38. 38, 39. Yeah. We just mm -hmm. stopped it at 25. Okay. Internally, we'll still have the 38 uh, okay. uh, schedule for our, our long-term Yeah, everyone employees. will see, receive the same raise. No okay. matter if you're a first year or, or if you're a 40th year, you're still going to get the raise. We're not capping it at 25, just our salary schedule will only go to 25. Five. So say you were hiring, uh, hiring yes. Mm -hmm. So if you were a 32-year veteran and I worked at Comal ISD and I decided to come here, then that's where you would go and give them the 25. Yeah. So anybody who's been a veteran to SMC ISD, they'll get, um, <clears throat> of course, they're going to be paid more, and that's mm -hmm. what they, mm -hmm. they're entitled to for being with the district for so long. And going back in with something that Mr. O'Donnell had mentioned about in the future, what's kind of our plans here, um, I will definitely say that going down to a kind of a, a more, uh, just kind of shrink the steps a tad will allow us to kind of broaden things in the future and that actually will help with even further smoothing out those steps. And so um, that will help us in our plans by, by uh, contracting that to 25. This might... 
I was just going to make a comment, but you can go first. My, I guess my final question from an HR standpoint, Mr. Watson, is when we do a 2.5% or a 3% raise for all employees with varying, I guess, daily rates, hourly rates, is that a best practice to do for someone who, say, makes seven hundred and or you know six hundred and seventeen dollars per day that are midpoint versus someone who makes I mean twelve dollars an hour so I mean obviously three percent of a bigger number is a bigger number mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering from an HR standpoint is that a best practice or why are we doing that tonight or well, why is it recommended that we do that tonight okay uh, well we are recommending a percentage the same percentage for for all employees um, so that's kind of our recommendation, um, but you're absolutely right. You heard Tasby mention when they came, was it last week or a couple of weeks ago, that um, it is not best practice to differentiate the, the raises because of, of compression that can develop. Um, if you remember that conversation um, a couple of weeks ago, um, as well as, you know, we do our, our raises typically off the midpoint which creates more equity versus this, versus if you just do it off the salary because that ensures everyone within that pay band, pay grade, receives the same amount of monies, which is best practice. I think those are good questions because I had the same concern and that was a comment I was going to make that if you're a clerical or a paraprofession, a 3% raise may not be as much because their salary is so much it's lower. It's a lot lower. It's a lot lower, and the cost of living, and the gasoline, sure. and everything they have to spend. I mean, it's best so. practice. I'm not saying that you, know, you can't do it, but it's just not best. Not best practice is what you were asking about. Any other comments, questions, Mr. McLaughlin? I have another question. Oh, you do. But okay. did you raise your hand? Go ahead. Let me get jumping. Go ahead. Um, so, if we have uh, any uh, teachers on an improvement plan from year to year. Do they receive the same increase um, as every other teacher, or is there are they frozen during that time? No, sir. They receive the, the same general pay increase okay. because we have a step schedule system. Okay. So this increase, we're going to give our lowest performer the exact same amount as our Higher highest performer. performer. Uh, figuratively, yes, sir. And actually. Actually. Yes. Okay. Mrs. Halsey? I was just wondering if you could show me where the bus drivers are in here. I'm not sure. I don't bus drivers? Mm -hmm. uh, bus drivers. They were hourly, weren't they? Hourly? Yeah, they're, they're at $16 an hour. Uh, we, kind of, we have them on a separate, because remember that was a board action right. that we have them on kind of a separate, uh, they're not listed on here because we have set that rate. So whatever rate we agree to tonight will not apply to the bus drivers? Yes. I think they're on the, uh, they're, they're going to be in your manual trades. Right. I mean, they're in here, but we don't have a $16 starting is what I'm saying. We have that separated out. I think they're in the But they're in pay grade, grade uh, three or four. And so, and so yeah. when we did, they're in the pay grade, but um, we're, they're higher than the um, minimum start. Right. So if we approve one percentage rate for all employees, does that apply to the bus drivers? Yes. Also? Yes. yes. But it is embedded in here then? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And we had to take them separately, remember, because um, we were losing people when we were coming back at Christmas. We were losing people. That's correct. Yeah, we made it a district standard that our um, hiring for that particular group would be 16 an hour. Mm -hmm. So it'll still remain at $16 an hour for any new bus driver coming in. New ones and coming in. Anyone who's been here um, will get the increase. So for next year, they will see that increase, whatever increase amount that is um, approved by the board. Okay. Mr. Adeland? Mr. Watson or Mrs. Griffith, custodial staff or food service employees in manual trades, what pay grade are they on? Uh, pay grade one. Pay grade one? Yes. So a 3%, if approved, the maximum recommended raise from the staff tonight is 3%. So a 3%, am I looking at a 3% from 1203 or from 1225? 1225, the new midpoint. So a 3% raise equals how much money more an hour for a food service employer maintenance staff or custodial? That would be times 40, right? Cents. On a weekly basis, I'm well. Uh, the 
Three percent on the new midpoint is thirty-seven cents. Thirty-six point seven five, yeah. And on our current pay structure, it's thirty-six cents per hour. So, per hour. Yes. I just. As an individual trustee, I have some concerns and reservations about approving a 3% raise for employees on, I mean, the clerical and manual trades pay scales, just because even at the maximum recommended percentage from staff, that is, I mean, less than 50 cents for a majority of those employees. And I, again, just kind of where I stand tonight is I will vote for it if that's what the motion is made, but I would like to see that number higher. And if anything, I'd be confident taking the teacher vote tonight and then delaying the manual trades and paraprofessional vote until June, because I'd like to see some additional options presented by staff. But I'm only one trustee, so I'll see if I get a second to that in a few minutes. With the questions? Well, that would be taking a different percentage. You're looking at different percentage increase for, uh, and I'm not saying that I, w I would not support that, but you would be looking at something entirely different as far as percentages is concerned for increases for basically staff versus uh, paraprofessionals or uh, custodial manu uh, under the manual trade. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's not something that I would not support. I'm just saying that we're looking at different percentages mm -hmm. and increases for what we've got here. Mm -hmm. We would have to dissect it and just take out what we want to take out and then come back at a later time. But and I'm sorry, Mrs. Kentia, just to clarify, because I do appreciate Mrs. Garcia's comments and I agree wholeheartedly, because I think in previous years we have approved, I think, administrative employees on one vote, teachers, which is coded, I think, three different positions, and then the hourly employees separately. So. Again, if there's interest or support from my colleagues, I'd like to look at that, a similar vote for salary increases like that we've done in the last two years. That's what I was gonna comment on. I think in the past, you all have taken it apart in a previous vote. The and the first two times that we went through this, we gave different percentages to mm -hmm. those different categories. To those different so categories. We gave the hourly and um, bigger. a bigger percentage in year one and year two, and this year we're, we've proposed a three across the board, although the d distinction this year is there was adjustments, you know, on the TASB survey to the whole scales, mm -hmm. so that seems, you know, that that'll take into some account where we had irregularities and benefit some employees, um, so uh, that's why I am okay with an across the board, you know, whereas in the past I supported splitting it. Ms. Giapanda? <clears throat> well, and it seems like we're, we're picking and taking things apart, and, and that is exactly where, what got us into the issues <laughs> that we have before. So I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think we need to decide on a pay grade and, and, uh, and him. And move on from there? Move on from there. Seems to me like that's what we need to do. But finding some common ground with Mr. Eric. I have some answers from the question that you asked earlier. Oh, that'll segue into my question. Oh, go ahead. You ready for it? Okay. So currently we have 190 employees um, that make $12 or less. Okay. In, in our clerical uh, professional professional schedule and our manual trades. Okay, thank you. Uh, what, uh, out, of, out of about 500. Okay. I mean, I would like Total. to see a, obviously not at once, but I would be supportive of some a three-year plan to reach that as a minimum. I mean, in these days, 12 bucks just yeah. doesn't go very far. I, I don't think it should be all at once or it would create some weird inequities in the schedule. But, you know, I would be supportive of seeing a, you know, multi-year plan to get there. We can do that. So. Mr. Redondo. So, and this is to Mr. Watson. I know that the adjustments as proposed address some of the compression and some issues that we've had with yes. salaries in years past. But for instance, if we approved a two and a half percentage increase, for the administrative employees and a 3% for teachers tonight, that essentially wouldn't affect compression because they're on co two completely different Schedules. scales and daily rates and so on and so forth, correct? How it, it can lead to compression is if someone moves from one pay schedule to another. Uh, and that's kind of what Tazzy was mentioned. We have some positions. Um, when they move to the administrative professional schedule, because they've been on another schedule, been receiving higher increases, they actually take a dip when they move to the admin professional schedule. 
So I guess in that hypothetical, it could be a veteran teacher who is right. on a very high pay scale, moves to an AP position, but they're actually getting paid less. And yes. what it but I mean, how many instances do you think we've encountered? It happens. That? It happens a few times a year. It happens yeah. a lot in this district. Probably more than you realize. And usually it's calculated based on the number of days. Yeah, days. And There's a days increase for administrative staff versus uh, instructional and they're scale. And they're concerned because maybe their daily rate may be the same or less, and they're in a leadership more position. Days. They get more days, right? They do get, get more, more days, days yeah. but they, unfortunately, many people don't look at it that way. They look at their daily rate. So. I have a question. Ms. Costilla? Mr. Carbona, I don't know, maybe you might know Mr. Watson. <clears throat> The, uh, our hourly employees, our paraprofessionals, uh, given the TASB study that we got, did, did they indicate whether they were where they needed to be uh, regarding hourly pay, or was it somewhere off to where they needed to be at? Well, they made some adjustments in some of those areas. Um, one thing I was very really proud of is if uh, you look at our, um, I think our custodian area, I think now they are, um, with the increase that, that TAS has proposed, uh, if my memory serves correct, they will at least make $20,000 a year, or very close mm -hmm. to it, and I was, I was happy to see that. For hourly? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, I, I think that all of us are very sympathetic to um, our custodians, our paraprofessional people and I, I and haven't been haven't been one for many years in the past I understand that uh, the fact that you're, some of them are down in the bottom of the totem pole and, and depending on where you're at uh, what you're making that's going to determine based on a percentage how much you're going to get right so my question is, is, is that are we where we need to be with these hourly employees? Because maybe that's where the question needs to be. Mm -hmm. If we're or at where we need to be with our, our hourly employees, because there's never going to be um, what would somebody would call an equitable distribution of increases because somebody always makes some higher than some somebody else makes lower. So maybe we need to make sure that we are where we need to be with our hourly employees. We can take those into um, additional adjustments, and if you want us to bring those back and look at certain areas, if you want us to look at I would food like service, that. and because it, it, it's gonna, yeah. what you're going to affect is going to be food service and custodial, and so um, if you want, we can bring those back and do some additional, maybe to those pay groups to try and increase um, those starting salaries in those areas. Or, or you know, you could give a higher raise for you know for that that area if that's something that you well, choose to I'm do. Well, I'm just one person here. You I'm know. just saying that we're looking at equity here to some extent, and we're not going to find it because there's always going to be people that make more than others. Mm -hmm. But my question is, are we where we need to be with some of these individuals at that that is then fair? for what they should be making versus maybe competition around the area. Are we paying them what they need, what we need to be paying them? Yes, ma'am, we are paying in the market, or if not, the adjustments were done by TASPE. They looked at all categories, all positions in our district. And so these scales uh, include the TASPE That's correct, they include the recommendations, the adjustments, the market analysis. It would be nice if, if their raise was at least 50 cents an hour mm -hmm. and not 36 cents. Of course, they can get another. I mean, they can move across their scale. Mm -hmm. The teachers don't have the ability to, move. like if someone's doing a superior job to receive more money, they all get lockstep no matter what, right? Worst, best, same thing. But the other employees, they can get raises from the supervisors if they're perform performing it. Mm -hmm. That's not no, possible. No, they don't, no they don't have merit pay, right? <laughs> Um, Ms. I, was, I thought there was something <laughs> positive in this. <laughs> Ms. Halsey? Um, I agree with what, everything my colleagues have said, except that I would like to see us move to $12 an hour quicker than three years, and because I think if we wait three years by the time we get there, then it's going to be it's even farther out ahead of yeah. us. So wait. my inclination this evening would be to go ahead and move on administrative and on t uh, teacher salaries and uh, get more information in June on ways that we can uh, better compensate our hourly. manual trades and hourly. Um, paraprofessionals, et cetera. Is that a motion? I'll second that. Um, you, if you'd give a percentage, I think you'll okay, get some Okay, I can seconds. make a motion. Okay. Um, I move um, that we approve the revised salary plan stipends and general pay increases at 3% for teachers, librarians, nurses, and administrative professional category 
and come back in June um, to take another look at increasing the clerical. rates for clerical, clerical and paraprofessional. A second. And I really, oh. we, have a, we have a second. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Let's go ahead and vote on that. Okay. If there's no further discussion, we can vote. All in favor? Seven. Consider granting public access and improvement easement to the city of San Marcos. Um, um, attached, you're going to find an easement, and actually, this is um, for a sidewalk that's for the. Um, and I brought a picture, but a sidewalk is already in, and apparently, when they did survey, they didn't have enough sidewalk is already been in and it's on our property so they need to do anything to make it um, legal legal so they need the words to make it legal yeah so that's why we're putting the cart before the horse but um it's did already we, been done did we approve the location or did we have, no did they consult I, at all they just poured it well they they did because they thought it was part of the subdivision and when they came to do the survey apparently it was on our part of the land so they need the easement to I guess we need uh, a motion. Fascinating. We don't have a motion yet. So is there anything we can get them to agree with us? <laughs> After the fact? I mean, when we build our new school? <laughs> well, actually, this is this is the subdivision individual, so... The uh, developer? Built yes, it. the developer, yes. It wasn't the city, it was the developer that did so this. So it wasn't approved by the city? Well, the, now the city is saying that they need the easement because they're on our they property. Took, because they took it. Huh. Yeah. So if we, I mean, I mean the, the sidewalk is a good thing. We want the sidewalks for our kids to come to school, so it's kind of a catch-22. Yeah. But it's on our land, and it's the easement. It's for the property that's behind. So, it's a vote um, after the fact. Yes, and so the city is requiring, so it's just a it's formality. Yes. I mean, if it was denied tonight, what would we ask the developer to tear it up? Or it is it our property, so we'd have to maintain it? it? I mean, but so We're gonna if we need don't it eventually. approve... Then it's either our responsibility or they tear it up and then it's a sidewalk that our students could have used yeah. essentially yeah i wouldn't um and then i guess we would have to yeah and then we could tear it up and then the city say that we're required to have a sidewalk and then we have to come back and at our expense <laughs> so so are, are we ready for a motion voting, yeah i second seconded by mrs Viapando. all in favor seven zero Consider approval of school lunch prices for 2017. I think I'm finally going to get a vote for one of my members tonight. So we did get a prayed, uh, I mean approved for the waiver. So our um, lunch prices will remain the same for next year for elementary full price Yay. being $2.20. Thank you, Mr. Boone. Yay. And um, high school, middle school will remain at $2.45. Okay. So. I move that we approve the lunch prices for the 2017-18 school year. I'll second. Laughlin <laughs> <laughs> seconds. I'm get that one. No, oh, that's okay. I got. That's all right. Finally, get all, all, all in favor. Seven zero. I'm abstaining. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. I thought. Oh no! I counted it too fast. Uh, consider approval of a plan of finance for the purchase of certain district equipment and directing district administration and consultants, Strade and Hosa and Company, Inc., Escamilla and Ponek, LLP, to proceed with the issuance of maintenance tax notes to purchase and finance such equipment. Um, wait, hold on. Okay, this item, <laughs> this item that we put forth in front of you is a, a district initiative, um, and so this the, this addition district initiative is to purchase laptops for every teacher in the district. This um, initiative is that we want to um, make sure that all of our um, teachers are given this brand new device for um, PD and also for, help me guys. 21st century learning. So what we, how we were planning on fin uh, financing this is um, in lieu of asking the board to take this out of fund balance um, because we're trying to make sure that we take a plan and we can sustain it. So this is the first part of this technology plan. We're buying the teacher devices and then it's going to uh, flow into uh, student devices and uh, for our um, ongoing technology plan. So what we have, are asking is that we take this, we finance it so it can be implemented in the budget and 
we can take this and sustain it for years on out. So for the next couple of years, we'll probably have to, and we're planning on having this as a three-year initiative. At the end of three years, we'll upgrade the teacher devices, and um, these devices will then become student devices, um, probably at the high school level. But um, as we work through this plan, we need to make sure that we have a plan that we can sustain in through the budget without coming every year and saying, okay, guys, we need an additional half a million. This year, we're going to need a million. This year, we're going to need two million. So in order to take this plan, because you have to have a replacement cycle, just like the buses, technology, um, you know, is out of date within three years. So um, with that um, with that said, um, that's why I have our finance people here tonight to talk about what that would mean to do a plan of finance. So. <laughs> Good evening, uh, board members uh, and staff and superintendent. For the record, name is Robert Tijerina with Estrada Hosa. We're the school district's financial advisor. Also with me this evening is Mr. Juan Aguilera of Escamilla and Ponic. He is the school district's bond counsel. Um, before I hand out the presentation, I just want to say congratulations to the board, to the superintendent, to the staff. I think the community said a lot when they approved the bond election. It said the, the trust in the leadership of both the elected officials and staff. So congratulations again. And again, I'll be handing out the presentation. It's a plan of finance. Thank you. Uh, 505,000 maintenance tax note series 2017. And again, this item, the action, if it is approved this evening, we will be coming back later. It's part of the time of the presentation. We'll be coming back later next month uh, with the final structure and the final uh, term sheet and the interest rate on the financing. And I believe everybody has a copy of this one. Yeah, on page one, we have the preliminary sources and uses. The funds will be used, as Ms. Griffith stated, purchasing an estimated 650 laptops. Uh, payment for professional services associated with the financing includes attorney general fees, uh, placement agent fees, uh, bond counsel and financial advisor. Uh, below, we have the sources, maintenance tax notes loan, 505000 The uses, we have the laptops, totaling estimated about 490000 an estimated total cost of issuance of 15000 Both the uh, sources and uses matched to the loan amount of $505,000. We go to page two, preliminary debt service. We have the par amount, which is the loan amount, 505000 The maturity, as Ms. Griffith stated earlier, a three-year structure. Uh, the interest rate, we're assuming an estimated 1.75. We feel pretty good that it's going to be lower than that. Uh, the average annual payment on this financing is about $174,259. Total principal and interest paid back at the end of three years, an estimated $522,777. Interest is about almost $18,000. The estimated fiscal year ending 2018 net assessed values is about $4.6 billion. This is what we used back when we did the bond election in January and February. That's preliminary. You should have already received a bit or probably a little bit more preliminary numbers a few weeks ago. They should be final in late July. So again, using just the estimated amount, about $4.6 billion, the estimated m and tax rate equivalent to an annual, average annual payment is just a little over a third of a cent. And again, we're not saying that the m and tax rate of $1.06 is going to increase. We're just saying out of that $1.06, just a little over a third, less than half a cent, will be used towards this annual payment from the operation and maintenance side. The first payment date will be uh, September the 15th, 2017. That is the beginning of the next <coughs> fiscal year. We did talk with Ms. Griffith and Mr. Cardona, and again, this structure will be callable at any time. That's going to be the request that if this item is approved, that it be part of the term sheet, that if the district wants to pay it off after their first payment uh, in September or after the first year, they can pay it off with no penalty. On page three, we have the financing team, the issuer, San Marcos. Uh, independent, uh, consolidated Independent School District, Financial Advisor, Bond Council, Placement Agent is William Blair, Purchaser is to be determined, and the Paying Agent also to be determined. The next page on page four, the preliminary timetable of events. Uh, this item is approved this evening. 
placement agent will go out on May the 29th to distribute the request for bids to at least uh, 10 to 12, 13 banks, maybe a little bit more. On June the 19th, that is your next scheduled board meeting. So at noon that Monday, the bids will be due on June the 19th. We'll come back later that evening at the regular school board meeting and present the final interest rate and term and who the actual purchaser was and who the actual paying agent will be. And again, if that item is approved on the 19th, the financing will close on August the 17th in this current fiscal year. Uh, again, that concludes my portion of the presentation. And if there's any questions, I'll turn it over to Mr. Aguilera. He'll go over the, the financing, the legal financing of a maintenance tax service. Ms. Halsey. I'll hold my question to the end. Uh, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. My name is Juan Aguilera, and I work with the law firm of Escamilla and Ponick, and uh, we've, we've been serving as, as uh, bond attorneys for the district for a number of years. I know this is our, th our third bond election, successful bond election, and congratulations to the district. Uh, and really, congratulations to the uh, to the district and the, and the students in the in the district. Uh, it was it was an interesting election. Uh, it seems overall that um, that that the, like Robert was saying, you know, the, the the public is behind you, the taxpayers are behind you. So that's that's great news. Maintenance tax notes, as as Robert has has mentioned, what you're looking at today is only a plan. You're not act actually going to finalize a, a or making a decision to whether you want to move forward you're just going to direct staff and and us uh, and the your consultants to be able to move forward maintenance tax notes we look at these things um, very common with school districts we've as a matter of fact just in the past two months we've done two or three of them uh, and they're typically used for purchase of equipment and for purchase of vehicles and any other type of uh, maintenance type of expense so they are different from your from your bond election, general obligation bonds, and that those are paid for out of your interest and in sinking fund taxes, and these are paid out of your M and O taxes. If there's any questions, I'm happy to Ms. answer Rapondo. those. I have a, a just a statement. Um, you mentioned our success with the bond. Uh, I would just like to say the success uh, of your both your um, agencies and and uh, our finance person here because it was an easy sell for for me when I was talking to people about the uh, the bond to be able to tell them that uh, we had had two defeasances and two uh, bond refinancing and so um, that that was so easy and and it was something that they could understand that's how come they didn't have an increase in the tax rate and so thank you, Karen, thank you all. Uh, I, I couldn't be more grateful for that information to be brought out very plainly to, for, me, for me to be able to explain it. I mean, I know that we approve them here, but it's under your recommendation. So thank you very much. That's what I have to say. Ms. Halsey, very good. Um, I echo uh, Ms. Biapanda's sentiments and appreciate all the work that went into that and the public support and public trust. I do have a question. Um, if you could please rehearse for us the justification for doing this via financing rather than using our fund balance. All um, right. Fund value of money. Um, what, I mean, if we're wanting to sustain this and bring this out, I mean, we could, we can spend it, but then when you look at it, people are saying that we're taking money out of fund balance at a one time um, rather than taking it and spreading it over a three year payment and making it a part of the budget where you're sustaining and uh, putting that. So it's all in perspective of how you look at it and how you want to sustain sustain it. We could, we just didn't want to come to you and say, hey, we're wanting to take another half a million dollars out of fund balance. Um, this was a way that we could come and say, hey, uh, let us take this, let us spread it over the use of these uh, devices so the cost goes into the budget and it's not a one-time hit to the fund balance. But if the district does not want to do the, fi the financing office and would rather take it out of fund balance, we can do that too. Um, just thought that this would be uh, better to make sh to, to since it was an operating thing to put it as part of the operating budget and spread it over the course and use of that equipment. I appreciate the option. I think that I would my preference would be to have this um, conversation as part of our next budget workshop or when we're looking to review the overall budget. I, I'm uncomfortable sort of handling it piecemeal. Um. Okay, Mr. Uh, McLaughlin. 
I'm concerned if we wait, then the teachers won't have it in time mm -hmm. for the staff development. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we want, like you said, if we want to later on pay it off out of fund balance, then we, we have the option to do that yeah. without any penalty. Mm -hmm. But I would hate to hold off and put everybody behind on staff development and, and everybody being on the same page. That's my concern. Well, we would have incurred the fees though already, right? If we, I mean, if we, once we initiate it, we would still have to pay the additional fees. Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, if this item is approved this evening, <coughs> no fees are incurred unless we come back on the 19th and say at that meeting we present the final interest rate, the purchaser or the, the purchaser of the bonds who's going to loan you the money. At that day of the item or that night, the item is not approved, there's no fees incurred. If there is, if it is approved, the fees are incurred. We close the financing 30 days later. All the uh, players, uh, all the consultants get paid, AG, financial advisor, placement agent, bond counsel. So yes, at that time, that you, pretty much you will be paying. Right, which fees. I'm saying if we then come back a year later and pay it off in fund balance, we've still paid more than we would have if we just paid it out of fund balance to begin uh, with. Yes, the and, the, and with. The, you will pay a little less because then we will, say you pay it off a year or two years early. You're just, uh, there's not going to be any penalty if the bank agrees to loan the money to pay off the loan ahead of time. So they'll, we'll just rerun the debt service and say, okay, instead of going out three years, we'll now it's going to be paid off within one year, so you accrue, you pay back less interest. Right, but I'm saying that we have to pay the service fees if we initiate it versus if we would just take the lump sum out of debt. Right, out of you save pretty much, right, right. you save it. roughly about, um, 27, say $30,000 or a little less. Yes, ma'am. Mr. McLaughlin? Just so I understand those fees, the cost to issuance, the $15,000, is that's an approximate approximation of what all the fees to the different providers would be for the issuance of the notes? It would be... A, that's not a cost to issue the laptops, that's to issue the... The, the notes, the, yes, the note The financing, yes, sir. Yes. Quite a, the other thing is, is that uh, it, it's such a small amount right. that we, Robert and I, have agreed to to lower the fee because the same amount of work that we I, I just did uh, a maintenance tax notes and Robert did the same thing for that was uh, ten million dollars. The same amount of work that goes into that and the same liability is the same thing. Yeah, I completely understand. So, but and I appreciate but, you making but, that concession. But it's, we we've been with this with the district now for a number of years, and we're happy to, to help out any way we can. And I think we're going to have some more bonds. You know that you know. <laughs> <laughs> But Ms. Halsey, to, uh, to even go a little bit further, you do. We actually the one thing, the first thing we asked uh, Ms. Griffith when she called for the maintenance tax notes is say, okay, let's go over the options. And the first one, we both said it almost at the same time: fund balance. Use it out of fund balance. Uh, but there is an annual rating call that we have, a surveillance, whether we issue the district, whether anybody that has outstanding debt, they have an annual surveillance. Whenever they issue debt, uh, in a conference call with a rating company, and one of the questions they ask when they review the audit, they always look to see is there this line item, say for example, it's half a million dollars for whatever it is, they will ask clearly to say, is this a one-time expense or is this gonna be an ongoing expense. So that's one thing they'll ask, and it could be uh, said it's a one-time expense mm -hmm. and this is what we used it for, but then we can come back, uh, we're gonna be back two or three years later and we're gonna do it again. So they'll note, okay, there's gonna be a gradual decrease of the fund balance, but then we also, they also asked Ms. Griffith, did you enter into any other financings? So this maintenance tax notes will also be disclosed. Say for example, it's approved, to date, it's approved a month from now. So they'll know, okay, now the district has an additional $174,000 of a maintenance tax and payment coming out of the existing dollar and six cents. They'll ask, are you gonna increase the tax rate to pay for it? And the question, and the answer will be, no, we're just gonna pull the slither out and just pay it from the existing dollar six. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, it's You're good. my follow up. Um, but by that same rationale, right? We could spend, we could make the one-time expenditure out of fund balance Absolutely. to start the program and then start budgeting it into our budget and putting that money, like yeah. calculating and for it as we go and expecting it to be an ongoing expense. Right. It doesn't have to be an either and yeah, or. Absolutely. Either way, we can explain that to whether you do the loan or whether you do the one-time expense. Thank and you. That, yes, ma'am. Mr. Redondo. I, this question is for Mrs. Griffith. I know we approved the 3% increase for administrative and 
teachers and that coding, I'm not going to go back to that, I promise everyone. But I know at our previous budget workshop, it talked about approving that was going to bring us into a budget deficit of over a million dollars, which we've kind of consistently done the last several years. And I know that the laptops are a one-time cost or purchase if we purchase them all this year, but it will reflect on the ledger for our budget year that we've essentially gone from like a $1.2 million budget deficit to a 1.7 or 8, whatever that number is, if we withdraw it all from fund balance, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. For this year, yes. Okay. And again, just as a final comment, I agree with Mrs. Hansen that if we can do this in a timely manner, then I'm okay with either option, but if it's for... I guess to expedite this process so that teachers can get the devices, mm -hmm. I'm comfortable doing this financing option tonight as presented by staff. Ms. Hansen. Like go ahead and approve the plan, and if we have, we'll have discussions between now and the June meeting, and we, we don't have to go by this, we can say, oh, we've changed our mind, we're going to go with the pay balance, right? But that's an option. Whereas if we don't approve anything tonight, then no, we're just evasive. We're, we're in a bind schedule. Yeah. So, one way or another, we need to stay on schedule so that staff fulfillment goes on on time. So, with that in mind, I move that we approve the plan of finance and authorize the administration to work with the district consultants on issuance and all other matters related thereto. I'll second. I'll second. Okay. I, had, I heard two second. seconds. Or she gave it to me, so. Okay, Mr. Redondo, you can second. All in favor? Six, zero. Six, I mean, 6 1. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was looking right at you and I knew you didn't vote. 6 1. I'm sorry. I don't think it's a terrible idea. It's just 32 grand, you know, um, that's like it's not going to the classroom. So I understand it as a budget device, but I, I guess playing it till June is not going to hurt us too bad. Okay. I'm fine with whatever the board wants right. to do. Take it out. I'm just trying to give you all some options. Uh, next item is the Consider Trust Property Purchase Offer on Suit 2001-0033. Um, we do have a bid for a piece of uh, property that was um, that's located in Lot 14, Block 33 of Victory Gardens. Um, we did get a bid amount um, of $450, and you can see that... Um, uh, the amount that was owed to us in judgment is twenty five seventy nine. So basically, we're waiving all that to put it back on the tax roll. Um, from what I understand, it goes back on the tax roll for the property value. Um, it gets assessed every year, and you pay based on the assessed value. Mm -hmm. So um, it's going to be whatever property is going for in San, in San Marcos. That's what determines your property value. That's what I'm being told. So just because he bought it at 450 doesn't mean his taxes will be at 400 uh, based on the 450 next year. It's based on the property value. I mean, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Sold Redondo. for 450 bucks. I mean, I think that would be his point to the taxing I mean, authorities, right? Is I paid 450 dollars. That's what it's worth. Uh, but he, it's on a settlement, so. Yeah. I know we've done this in numerous years, so just for the conversation purposes, I'm going to make a motion that we reject the offer from the individual <laughs> wanting to buy the parcel. I don't know if I'm going to Do get I hear a second? second. Mr. McLaughlin seconds. We're open for discussion. So if it sold for $450 and hmm. that would be the assessment for this year, the taxes will be paid on that. So you're saying next year it could be assessed at a higher rate, possibly. Um, what I'm being told is that for this year it will be assessed. I guess they'll, yeah, they'll, for this year it'll be prorated um, at that amount, and then next year it'll be at whatever the assessed value is that the at state that, point, uh, right that the appraisal district appraises at. It could be 5760, or if it values go up, it could be higher or lower. I don't see land going for any lower, but. Okay. Any other discussion? I, I did go by there to check it out. It's just a small, it's not very large, is it? Yeah, I think he puts it in his, um, that you can't even put a house on it, so. I, I mean, I, I can't even Mrs. Hanson? What, what are they going to do? Oh, on the tax roll, um, I think so, too. Rather than just sitting there and not doing anything, so I'm going to vote against this because I think it's very important to get it back on the tax roll. Well, if he's listening out there, I would take what he owes the district, that 2700 bucks. but I mean, $450, well, if that's did. what it's value, valued at, getting it back on the tax rolls is going to give us about it. 9 bucks a year. Well, it's going to go up. Yeah. It's better than well, what it's doing now. And then just to follow up and to explain why I'm motioning to deny, obviously this 
individual has a long-term strategy. And this is not seen as a net loss to them, and it's an investment property. And I think it's embarrassing on my part to approve or you know subsidize what someone is doing for their own financial gain because I don't see them forecasting losing money in this deal. So I mean, I think it's almost a little bit disrespectful that they're coming in so low with their bid. Okay. And that's why I motioned to project their offer. Ms. Viapando, you have a well, comment? According to the document here, the value is 5760 I understand that there, we're just getting a minuscule amount, but it, we always get a minuscule amount because the taxes have gone up so high on it. Uh, the, the, um, the, the thing is, I agree with Ms. Hansen, is we need to get it back on the tax roll so we can get our taxes the way they should be. Even though the amount it would be back on the tax roll would be a very minuscule amount. We might start getting better offers if we said no once. And if this fails, Karen, I'll give you nine dollars tonight for the year's taxes next year. Um, it says since uh, 2004. Four. Yeah, it went to tax sale on January 6 of 2004. And granted, this is the way it happens all the time. For less. I think it's the way we've done it all the time. I don't think it has to well, be done this way. No. <laughs> Are we ready for a vote? Let's do it. We're voting on. We're voting on rejecting it. All in favor? Okay. Five. All opposed? Two. We're done. I saw that property. I think he's got plans for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. I, I know exactly where it is. I mean, we're streaming. I'm eager to sell this property for any of you listening out there. Okay, discussion possible approval date for June bond workshop. <laughs> June bond workshop. Back up here, Karen. <laughs> we thought you were done. Um, we are recommending to have a bo uh, bond workshop on a Monday, June 5th at 6 o'clock. Um, the purpose of that will discuss the plan of construction, which will include, um, I forgot my notes. I um, gotta look at my calendar. The timeline. Uh, the timeline. This the um, the the method of procurement, yes. and the uh, schedule, um, and then also we'll look at site selection, and um, uh, the third item was the um, advisory bond advisory. Can we? Hmm. Well, the thing. There's one more thing uh, from. Um, <laughs> we have agenda prep on that day. Oh, at the, we at combine the, them. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, we can also tie in the uh, budget and bring you some numbers on budget as well at that time for manual and auxiliary. Because we're already scheduled we for agenda, agenda prep. prep. We have agenda well. prep. So do y'all? I'm sorry. So I have a question on the agenda. Did I mishear you? Did you say uh, discussion of a commission, a committee to yes. an oversight committee? Yes. I just want to collapse. I don't want to come at lunch and then after. Yeah. You'd rather I mean, do it all, all together. All yeah, yes. just come once and knock it out. Yeah. Can it all the Everybody in agreement with that? As far as the length of time, though, do you want it at lunch for the entire no, 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 all no. in the evening? Yeah, I guess okay. all in the evening. I just wanted to can't. suggest that, that it's all in the evening instead of yeah. a three-hour marathon meeting at lunchtime. And that we okay. go ahead and, I guess, agenda. So we'll have agenda prep. We'll have the, uh, the bond um, issues and then we'll also budget. Yes. Okay. Starting at what time? Do we Six need a motion for that? June bond workshop no, now? No, just direct. No? Just direct. Okay. Just direct. Okay. So we're going to six o'clock. And I'll end it. Oh, wait, wait, before we move in adjourn. No, we, it is no, we just instructed it admin. It's just uh, before we adjourn, Mr. Cardona. Oh. oh, you want me to do it? We're going to give a shout out to the Rattler Fest and just a shout out to the Rattler Fest. Yes, yeah, for Rudy. For Rudy Espinosa. If y'all didn't go, it was a nice event for first time, but very nice. it was very nice. So I know he's watching, so hi. <laughs> Rudy. Hey, Rudy. Yeah. Okay, now we'll go. Motion. I move the adjourn. Second. second. I'll second it. All in favor? Hey. Se seven. Ms. Costilla, did you vote? Oh, no. Seven zero. Oh. Man, I don't know. Yes, ma'am. Do I need this on any of that? I think so. Good God, y'all need to get the air conditioner fixed.